Well, good morning. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, pray that you've had a good week. Uh, looking forward to the next week. We're going to continue on here at Sharon Heights Baptist Church with our study through the Gospel Project. Uh, I have enjoyed it. I really enjoyed hearing the many different teachers in the church. Oftentimes we don't get to listen to many different teachers because we're all in our own classes. So I've, I've enjoyed listening to uh, uh, the past teachers, uh, especially Brother Brady last week. I've actually got Brady in here with me today so I can actually have somebody in here that's breathing, breathing and alive, uh, so it won't be so odd sitting in a classroom full of empty people. And uh, I thought about today as I was driving to church, uh, I pulled up in the parking lot, and of course the parking lot is empty, and it's very difficult. Uh, it is difficult. I walked to the church doors, and uh, there was none of my brothers standing there to greet me or shake my hand or maybe even give a hug or uh, maybe even tell me what's going on in their life, how they can be a blessing to me or how I can be a blessing to them by listening to maybe some of their prayer requests. I would come through the doors of the church a few minutes ago and there's no ladies at the welcome desk uh, there to help with children or get children to classes and uh, oftentimes you hear the celebration choir warming up singing songs and, and the men at the church and the ladies playing the piano and the instruments and the drums and none of that was going on. Uh, you don't get to spend that time in the morning times on Sunday mornings with your brothers in Christ going through a, a prayer time, taking prayer requests, and just hearing the men of God as a collective group praying for all those prayer requests. You miss all that stuff. And I made my way down the hall and started up the steps, and there's no smell of fresh coffee. Uh, you get up to the top of the stairs, and you don't smell those breakfast casseroles or the blackberry cobbler that Miss Elise makes and the many other things that many other women and men in our church make for breakfast time. Uh, you, you don't hear the fellowship going on in the halls. And you, you see all the empty classrooms and you know that there's no prayer requests that you can't hear from your fellow classmates that you can pray for. And it, it's, it just, it's extremely difficult, but thankful for the media ministry here at Sharon Heights and the many other churches that are doing it live. And it, it hits kind of bridge the gap because you miss fellowship. You miss fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, you miss the fellowship of the bride of Christ. That's really what we are. It's what the Bible calls us. We are the bride of Christ. We are uh, the church that God has started. And it kind of leads me to the first question in this week's Sunday school uh, lesson that we have. And it says, what are some aspects and symbols used in wedding ceremonies that you have found to be particular, particularly meaningful? When you think about your wedding, I think about my wedding, and maybe if you're not married yet, you can look forward to it. We've got Brady, like I said, sitting here with me. He's not married. But you think about what goes on in wedding ceremonies? You think about maybe the vows that you say, uh, the rings. I have my ring on. I have crosses on each side, which is a reminder that if I'll keep my eyes focused on Christ and my wife Mindy will keep her eyes focused on Christ and we'll grow closer together and closer towards him. And that's really the main focus of the wedding ceremony is the bride and the groom. As you see, the groom stand there waiting for the bride to make her entrance through the doors and everyone stands. That is, that's really the, the appropriate focus of a wedding ceremony. Secondly, the most common role of the guest is to celebrate the union of the bride and the groom. When the vows are spoken and when the ring is placed on fingers and then the bride and groom is announced as husband and wife and they leave off together. Uh, it's one of the focuses and maybe the second point of the lesson that we'll learn today. We'll talk about the bride and the bridegroom. But the first point in our lesson today, as we get into our lesson, it's in John 1, 29 through 34, as we learn about Jesus as a lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Now, before we get started, it's always appropriate. I want to uh, take a minute and pray, pray for you, pray for myself, and I ask the Lord to help us. So let's pray. Lord, I do love you, and I thank you. I thank you for this day. I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to stand in a empty church, but be able to proclaim your word to my brothers and sisters in Christ who are at home, uh, to those who are maybe in the nursing homes, to those who are homebound all the time, this provides an avenue for us to get the gospel out to those. And I pray that you would not only use me, but you would help me, that my focus and the words that will be said will be to uplift you, that would glorify your name. And I pray that you're helping people during this time, which is a terrible time. It's a difficult time. It's a troubling time. But it's still a time that we can keep our mind and eyes focused on you. And I pray that as we gather around our Sunday school lesson today, that you would help us. And like I've always prayed, Lord, if you'll give us the help, then we'll get the help that we need. And I pray that you'll bless us, you'll help us, 
and we'll give you glory for it. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. So like I said, this first point is Jesus is the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. This is John 1, verses 29 through 34. If you have your Sunday school book, you can read along with us. If not, you can get your Bible out and follow along in your Bible. In verse 29 of John 1 says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I told you about. After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he, exist, he existed before me. I didn't know him, but I came baptizing with water so he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he rested on him. I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water told me, the one you see the Spirit descending on and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So early on we pick up in verse 29. It says the next day. Now you, if you read your Bible through the first chapter of John, before these verses you'll see that the previous day John was witnessing about Jesus and he was baptized. And that was the day before. And then our lesson picks up the following day. It says John saw Jesus coming toward him. And said, here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, I don't necessarily like this translation. Other translations say, it doesn't say here is. It says, behold. And I like that word a whole lot better. When you think about behold, it is an attention getter. And really what John is going to tell us in these verses is, look at Christ. It's what we all need to do any day and every day. But especially for this people and people of our time, look at Christ. John, John will say, don't look at me. Uh, don't look towards your, your good works that you've done to save you. Don't look towards your religious rituals. Don't look towards church attendance. He says, no. He says, look at, the, look at the Lamb of God. John had said in verse 21 earlier, he says, I'm not the Christ, but here is the Christ. Look at him. Here is the Lamb. John says, the Lamb, which is the only Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he takes away the sins of the world, and, God, and John testifies that he is the Lamb of God, which means that God sent Jesus to bear our sins, to take away our sins. Not necessarily for every sinner, but for Jews and Gentiles alike, and for people of all nation and tribe and tongue and language. And probably talks about just the original sin of Adam that we're all born into. It's singular, that God would send Christ, his Lamb, to take away the sin of the world. John would go on to say that this is the one I told you about. Those previous days, John was telling those people that would come to him that he would point them to Christ. And John says, I've told you about him. He says, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me. When you think about that, John was actually born before Jesus. But he says here that he's testifying about a man who, who, comes, who ranks ahead of me, but before he existed, he existed before me. So we know that John was born before Jesus, and Jesus was born after him, which speaks of Jesus' humanity. But when John says that he ranks ahead of me because he existed before me, I think that speaks of Christ's deity, the deity of Christ. John went on to say, he says, I, I didn't know him, but I came baptizing water so that he might be re revealed to Israel. And John testified, he said, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he rested on him. Now there's another word, of different translations that I read there that I'd like. I, instead of saying that the dove descended from heaven and rested on him, I, I like the word where he says he he remained on him. He just, just, just didn't, the Spirit just didn't rest on Jesus and then leave him, it remained on him. And if you like, look at the verses, back in Isaiah 11, chapter 2, it said, The Spirit of God shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of might, the Spirit of knowledge, and the Spirit of the Lord. Also, if you can read in Isaiah 61, 1, it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. This is Jesus talking about himself. And again, in Luke chapter 4, verses 18, I believe it is, says the same thing, that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, that it remained with him. John goes on to say that, he said, I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water told me, once you see the Spirit descending and resting on him, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And we think about who is it that sent John? John was sent, if you read early on in John chapter 1, verse 6, it says that there was a man sent from God 
whose name was John. So we know that God sent John, and John was just being obedient to what God had told him to do as he was a forerunner to Christ out there making the way previously before Christ came. He would tell folks about Christ, tell them they needed to repent. He didn't necessarily know, but he was just being obedient. And God says, the one that you see the, the dove resting on, that would be the one that was come. Once you see the Spirit descending and resting on him, is what the Word of God said. He is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. John goes on to say, he says, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Knowing this and knowing who Jesus is in our lesson, it kind of helps keep us strong when certain difficult circumstances uh, come into our life because oftentimes those certain circumstances that are difficult when it comes in our life, it, it may cause us to doubt. Uh, later on, John the Baptist, you'll find that he's in prison and he began to doubt whether Jesus was the Messiah. And he sent some of the disciples to ask Jesus and Jesus sent those disciples back. He says, you go back and you report to John what you see and what you hear. Indeed, Jesus was the lamb who came to take away the sins of the world. If you think about these verses that, behold, here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's verses that we've heard so many times. Maybe it's become familiar to us. Uh, maybe it doesn't shock us anymore. But really, it should. You think about those people in that day as they were gathered around listening to John. It was a radical thing for John to say this about a, a young Galilean carpenter uh, to a bunch of Jewish people. For centuries, they knew that the way their sins were removed, or they, were, they would take an unblemished lamb to the best of their ability. They would try to find one and know they would sacrifice that lamb uh, or take it to the priest to be sacrificed to atone for their sins. And now John here is standing here pointing to Jesus saying, Behold, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Would have been different for those people. Uh, but if you think about those Old Testament rituals where they would sacrifice those lambs. Those lambs could never change the heart of the people. They, they never would. Uh, they would never permanently remove sin. It couldn't permanently remove the penalty, the penalty of the sin, nor could it remove the power of the sin. Uh, but thank goodness, it says in our lesson, but it says, but it's Jesus as the perfect Lamb of God removed both through his crucifixion and resurrection. He removed the penalty and the power of our sin. Because of our union with the risen Christ and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, sin's penalty and power are gone. There is no condemnation for we who are in Christ Jesus. We have received a new course of life, enabling us to walk by the Spirit through His power that now lives within us. So the power of that sin is gone. Uh, the penalty for that sin is gone. But does it mean that the sin itself may not still tempt us there may, may be what our lesson calls as phantom pains which if you think about phantom pains if you were to thank someone who is an amputee maybe someone who has served our country in military or in war or just think about an individual who may through a tragic accident uh, lost some parts of his body uh, which I have an own brother who has uh, lost a little bit of his toes through a tragic accident years ago and I can remember him telling me Many years ago when I was just a teenager, he said, oftentimes I still feel that part of the body as if it was still there. there those are those phantom pains. That, that limb, that arm, those fingers, that toes, that leg or that foot may be gone, but there's still the pains and maybe sometimes even the sensation of itching that it, it's still there. And though the penalty of our sin is gone and the power of our sin are gone, that stem, the sin is still somewhat still lurking there like a pain, like a thorn in our sign like a thorn in our side to, uh, to try to hinder us, to try to hurt us, to try to tempt us, uh, to fall back in those temptations. But just rest assured that if you know Christ as your Savior, as what John would say, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, know that the power of that sin in your life is gone, the penalty for that sin in your life is gone, and praise God, you can rest assured that you are free and you are free indeed. So we look at first point that Jesus is the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Now we can move on to the second point where you think about Jesus is the groom who prompts great rejoicing in his friends. No doubt a saved individual, when he is saved, he can't do nothing but rejoice. 
when you think about Christ and what Christ has done in our lives and the lives of these individuals, when Jesus healed someone, oftentimes you saw him rejoicing. A lame man would get up and leap and walk and jump and scurry about his, about his way. So Jesus prompts great rejoicing in his friends, but he is the groom who prompts that. And in these verses, we move ahead a couple chapters and we move to John chapter 3, verses 25 through 30. And it reads, it says, Then a dispute arose between John's disciples and a Jew about purification. So they came to John and told him, Rabbi, the one you testified about and who was with you across the Jordan is baptizing and everyone is going to him. And John responded, No one can receive anything unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Messiah, but I've been sent ahead of him. Verse 29 says, he who has the bride is the groom, but the groom's friend who stands by and listens for him rejoices greatly at the groom's voice, so this joy of mine is complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. Think about that. Love the way that ends. But the way it begins in verse 25 starts out with a dispute. I no doubt those temptations are always there between individuals, and a dispute arose between John's disciples and the Jew about purification i read many different commentaries this week most of them i tell you they're not really sure sure about that uh, exactly what that dispute was but they had uh, no doubt had an alter altercation and uh, when they had that altercation verse 26 says that they came to john and they told him and they came to john and told him because like it says in the next word it says rabbi now rabbi to them would have been teacher they looked to john as a teacher and it says the one you testified about and, and was with you across the Jordan is baptizing and everyone is going to him think about that is this not the goal of every church is this not the goal of every ministry is this not the goal of as us as individuals every person to do what these people are doing is to send them to Jesus I like that where it says everyone is going to him that, that's our goal our goal is just simply just to point everyone towards him and that's what they are saying what does John think about this? John says that no one can receive anything unless it has been given to him from heaven. You think about that. Now John recognized his role. Uh, John recognized the ministry that God had given him. Uh, he recognized the gifts that God had given him. Now, now, no doubt we all have our own gifts. We all have our abilities. We all have our limitations. But we should take our gifts. We should take our abilities. And we should do what John says here. He says, no one can receive anything unless it's been given to him from heaven. He recognized where it come from. He recognized his limitations. And he said, I'll just do the best of my ability to try to point everyone towards Christ. Paul, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 7, reminded the Corinthians, he says, What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you have not received it? Jesus says to Pilate later on in this book of John in chapter 19, verse 11, he says, you have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. Recognize like John that all we have comes from one good father, which is above, which is our minds. The minds that we have come from God. Uh, I think about Nebuchadnezzar. As Pastor Jesse was uh, commenting on one of our previous Sunday school lessons when we were meeting together, he commented that God had taken Nebuchadnezzar's mind. What would it be like to have to walk around and do like Nebuchadnezzar did, knowing that God has the ability to take our minds? What about our money? Our money comes from God. What about our ministries? Wow. No one can receive anything unless it comes from above. All that we have, all that we are, come down from heaven as a good gift from, your, from our Father. Verse 28 picks up and says, You yourselves can testify that I said... I am not the Messiah. John had repeatedly told these individuals that he is not the Messiah. That's a good, good lesson for all of us. Uh, I'm not the Messiah. When things don't go our way, we have to just bow and acknowledge that God, you are alone, are the one that's from above. We are not. It's a good lesson for us to think about that. We are not the Messiah. John recognized it. He testified to these people. He said, I am not the Messiah. But... John did say, I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the groom, but the groom's friend who stands by and listens for him rejoices greatly 
at the groom's voice. And John was going back to that previous uh, introduction that I talked about in that lesson. You think about during the wedding ceremony that the groom would stand there and uh, the groom's best man would stand by. For me, the best man in my wedding was uh, my dad, which is my father, but he's also uh, a good friend. I love my dad. I'm thankful for my dad. He stood by, and no doubt that every groom has a best man, but there comes a time when that best man has to step aside and he goes and sits down, and that's what John is saying. John said, there comes a time in my ministry where the groom comes forth, and I just simply take my place seated, looking towards him, pointing people towards him. And John goes on to say that, so this joy of mine is complete. He must increase, but I must decrease hmm john told these people he said your cause for concern of what's going on is my cause for great joy think about that they had a dispute they came to john john said the very thing that you're wondering about that you're disputing about that these people are no doubt going to a different part of the jordan river to see jesus uh, wondering why they're not remaining with john john said i've, I've done all i need to do and your cause for concern and your cause of dispute is just causing me great joy because all I am is just simply like a signpost pointing people to Jesus. And as those people go to Jesus, then I am fulfilling the role that I need to do. And he goes on to say, he must increase, I must decrease. Think about that. He must increase, <clears throat> I must decrease. I was thinking about that uh, I think it was the day before yesterday I was telling Anthony a while ago that I was at home cutting some wood, trying to lay a little floor in the house. And uh, my little nephew Bryson was outside riding his bicycle and he come over there to me just out of the blue. He said, Brad, and I said, what is it, buddy? He said, uh, I can't see the stars anymore in the sky. And I said, well, of course you can't, buddy. I said, when the sun comes up, you can't see the stars anymore. Isn't that true? That's kind of what John is saying here. He said, I must increase, I must decrease, but Christ must increase. He is saying that when God comes forward, there's no need for a lamp when the true light is there. I like that. Like the morning star that fades as the sun rises, John saying, I'm just going to continue to fade away off into obscurity, and Christ will continue to increase uh, like the noonday sun that rises. He is the ultimate and the true sun. You think about that. True worship. True worship for John. Hopefully we can say the same for ourselves. True worship of Jesus prompts us to promote Jesus, not ourselves. Never in the life of John did he try to promote himself. Never did he try to be front and center. Never did he say, I'm the Messiah. No, he always told his individuals and his disciples at the time, I told you that I'm not the Messiah. Here he is, and now that he's here, I'm going to fade away, and he's going to continue to rise to prominence. He'll be front and center. Why is it? Here's a good question in our lesson. What are some reasons we may struggle to make much of Christ and less of ourselves? What are some reasons that we may struggle to make much of Christ and less of ourselves? Here's one. Uh, we don't know him by faith. Another reason is we don't know him as well as we should because we don't spend time in the word of God and in praying. We have prideful hearts that enjoy the attention and affirmation of others. Isn't that true? Oftentimes we have to deal with pride in our life. Maybe this is an issue that they try to think with John. John, John said, no, I don't, I don't deal with that pride. But we do. So we seek those things for ourselves and studying putting the spotlight on Jesus. We want those things. We want them for ourselves. We want the attention for ourselves. No doubt it may be a struggle for you. Another one is we find it awkward to praise Jesus in the presence of others. Do you find it awkward to praise Jesus in the presence of others? Maybe in front of your own family. Maybe in front of your own friends. Maybe in front of some of your own coworkers. We struggle to make much of Christ and less of ourselves. True worship of Jesus prompts us to promote Jesus, not ourselves. So any opportunity that we have, we should try to promote Jesus, to tell of him, to tell of what he's done, to tell of what he can do. So you think about 
with those two first points that Jesus is a Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I say amen to that. The second point was Jesus is the groom who prompts great rejoicing in his friends. No doubt that he does. And as we move on to the third and final point, it says that Jesus is the Son who gives eternal life to those who believe. This is John 3, continuing on John 3, 31 through 36. Now, if you think about that last statement that John has for us, that he must increase, but I must decrease, all of those previous verses that we just read was the decreasing of John, telling as individual. And now the verses that follow that are the increasing of Jesus. Verse 31 picks up, it says, The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth is earthly and speaks in earthly terms. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, and yet no one accepts his testimony. The one who has accepted his testimony has affirmed that God is true. For the one whom God sent speaks God's words, since he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who rejects the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. Ooh, some great verses to think about, not only just for this moment, but when I'm finished for the rest of the day, as you have an opportunity to look back, study for yourself, go a little bit deeper than these verses, and maybe our Sunday school lets and takes us. Uh, you can spend the rest of the day maybe thinking about these verses and studying these verses. John says in verse 31, the one who comes from above is above all. Later on in John 8, 23, it says, Jesus says, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. In fact, John 1, 3, John testifies, all things were made through him. Even the world that Jesus himself came to. The one who comes from above is above all. Of course he's above all because he made all things and all things were made for him and all things were made by him. John goes on to say that the one who is from the earth is earthly and speaks in earthly terms. So when you think about that, we're just earthly individuals that God has made and created, which means if we're from the earth then we're just we're really limited in knowledge, we're limited in, in our understanding, we're limited in our abilities. And even as we previously talked about before, we're limited in the gifts that we have that God has given us. And we're limited in opportunities uh, to share those gifts. And John, like we said before, uh, knew that his time and his ministry uh, was a fail in comparison to when Jesus came. He goes on to say, the one who comes from heaven is above all. When you think about one that is above all, that is everything that Christ is. He is all-knowing. He testifies to what he's seen and heard, and yet no one accepts his testimony. What a what an eye-opening statement that the one who comes from above, who knows all things, who is all-powerful and all-knowing, has all the knowledge and wisdom. Uh, as we read that verse earlier in Isaiah 11, too, that he was spirit rested on him, the spirit of counsel and might and wisdom and understanding, spirit of knowledge and spirit of the fear of the Lord yet who has all those things and knows all these things, would testify, and here it says in our Bible, yet no one accepts his testimony. What a terrible thing to think about. But there are some that will accept his testimony. As verse 33 testifies, the one who has accepted his testimony has affirmed that God is true. For the one whom God sent speaks God's words, since he gives the Spirit without measure so that's a there's no limitations to the spirit of god when christ gives it to you he gives all that you need verse 35 says the father loves the son and has given all things into his hands the one who believes in the son has eternal life but the one who rejects the son will not see life instead the wrath of god remains on him there's that word again earlier on as i testified to the first point when we read that word that the dove came down and it rested on Jesus. And I said that the, a better word would be to remain. Here that word is again. When you reject the Son of God, when you do like these individuals early on, it says when you reject his testimony, 
The only thing left for that individual is for the wrath of God to remain on them. We have an opportunity every time we read our Bible and God speaks to us and pray that he opens up our hearts and our minds that we have an opportunity to respond. I'm going to read a paragraph in our Sunday school lesson that says, When it comes to responding to Christ, the Bible is clear in passages such as this one that there are two options. There's eternal life or eternal judgment. You are either alive in Christ or dead in sin. You are either a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. You are either in Christ or you are not in Christ. Jesus said plainly that he is the only way we can get to the Father. That's John 14, 6. In this area, there is no middle ground. Either we are on a path that leads to death or, or we get to receive eternal life. And that eternal life is one of complete abundance. One where we get to experience the Spirit without limits. Like it says in John 3, if you look back again to verse 34. That God gives the Spirit without measure. While it's tempting, it says, for us to think about the issue of eternal judgment in hell as if it were great, it is not. To be fair, there are many issues that we encounter in life that are kind of gray, that are fuzzy. It's kind of unclear. But the fate of those who reject Jesus throughout the entirety of their lives is not one of them. The eternal life we receive through Christ is an abundant life, both here in this life and in the ones to come. But the opposite is true for those without Christ. Unbelievers will receive the fullness of God's wrath against sin in eternal judgment. And if you want to learn just a little bit about the wrath of God, you can look back in the Old Testament and see how individuals maybe were dealt with, not only them, but sometimes whole families and Thousands upon thousands of people, but you yourself, you yourself alone have an opportunity to respond to the word that you hear from God. Hmm. Hopefully you respond and re receive that eternal life instead of rejecting and receiving that eternal judgment. That will last forever in hell, which is described as a lake of fire and the second death. So here's an application that it says in our lesson. We do not serve a God who withholds from his children. No, he does not. He gives freely. When we are in Christ, we get all the blessings promised to the Son because we are in him. God has given all things into Jesus' hands, and when we are in Christ, we get access to all those things as well. We have to be careful not to think about abundant eternal life in earthly terms. Now listen to this statement as I underlined it, and I want to make sure that you hear it and I may even repeat it. Following Christ does not exempt us from hardships in this life. It does not. Following Christ will not exempt you from hardships in this life. You may indeed hear this lesson, and you may have God working in your heart and in your mind and in your life. Uh, conviction may set in on you. Uh, you may respond as this lesson would tempt you to do and hopefully all the previous lessons from all the previous teachers you've listened to and you may in a sense do like the early disciples of Jesus that you may begin to accept Jesus' testimony and you may begin to follow him but that does not mean hardships will not come into your life. Uh, that is not true. The abundant life that we receive through Christ is so much more greater than anything that this world could offer. And it cannot, cannot be measured through earthly standards. Remember, our, our knowledge is limited. Our understanding is limited. So there are some things that we just simply can't understand. And the, and the abundance of things to come for us as believers is far greater than we can ever understand. I can't remember the verses. It just comes to my mind. I believe it's later on in Revelations. I think it talks about there's uh, some sort of silence in heaven for a period of time. And maybe that's when we get there, we get that true knowledge and that true understanding and we get that spirit of counsel and might and that knowledge when it comes. Maybe that's why there's a silence as we try to take in all that we see. Life through Christ means that we get God himself. And that's all we need. He is the true source of prize. 
of the abundant life that we desire. So you may be out there listening today and you have may have spent, maybe you're somebody young like Brady, early 20s. Maybe you're in your 30s or 40s or 50s or maybe, bless God, you're later on in your years and maybe you say, well, Brother Brad, I have just tried and tried and tried to fill my life with, with, with so much different stuff and it's never led anything because that's not an abundant life that God has planned for you. The abundant life that he has planned for you is a life that's, centered on Christ, following Christ, obedient to Christ, and trying to lead others towards Christ, just like John the Baptist uh, did so well early on in his ministry. But now he points everyone to Jesus as the eternal Son of God who gives life to all those who believe. So here's a probably the last question that's in our lesson today. It says, what should we expect from people in a relativistic culture when they are confronted with the gospel's clear distinction between those who are in Christ and those who are not. Of course, we know that the days we live in, there's a lot of different confusion, the culture that we live in. You hear many different things, and some of it's distorted, and some of it's just absolutely wrong. But when we give the gospel, the true gospel, in our culture, in our time, to people who don't know and the people who don't understand, what are we confronted with? Here's some of the examples that it lists. We should expect to be labeled as intolerant. We should expect to be rejected, not only us, along with the message of the gospel that we proclaim. So if you go out and you give the gospel to individuals like we talked about earlier, whether it's your family, whether it's your friends, whether it's your coworkers, or whether it's somebody you come in contact with, uh, rest assured there's going to be some that's just going to reject you and reject the gospel that you proclaim. Third one is we should expect some to hear and believe the message and come to faith in Christ. And that alone should be good enough to drive us to continue to go and go and go to the next individual. Some's going to reject, but some's going to receive. Another one is we should expect people to take offense at being told they are under God's wrath and headed for hell unless they believe in Jesus. And that's how the lesson finishes up. The one who believes in the Son of God has eternal life. But the one who rejects the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. I'm thankful those words come from the Bible and not from myself. So if I happen to run across an individual and they take offense to maybe me and the message that I proclaim that's of the gospel, uh, maybe they don't want to hear that they're under the wrath of God, but the Bible speaks for itself and tells us that if you reject him, the wrath of God will remain on him, not rest, but will remain.